Sure, my name is Michael Samus. I'm the Executive Vice President of Operations and CFO for Universal Music Publishing Worldwide. Um, Universal is the uh, largest music publisher uh, in the world, uh, subsequent to our acquisition of BMG. Uh, we have the highest uh, market share of any music publisher, and uh, I look after the global finance and uh, uh, operations of the company. Well, you know, music publishing, it's a, little, it's a little easier to sleep. It's not quite as volatile a business as the recorded music business. So, uh, but, it, but it still has its share of, uh, of uh, issues, concerns, uh, and things that need to be addressed in, in, in the marketplace today. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, not, not quite as, uh, as uh, difficult to sleep as uh, some people on the recorded music side, I would think. Biggest challenges as a company, uh, I think, are the same for most major companies, and that's how to uh, monetize some of the uh, uh, new revenue streams that exist out there. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very different environment now than, say, music publishing might have been 10 years ago or even seven years ago. Uh, it's very different now with, uh, you know, the MySpaces and the YouTubes and Googles and uh, and uh, these are all new revenue streams, and we're constantly searching for more. So the, uh, uh, the, the most difficult thing as a music publisher, and, and I think this would go for any businessman or any business person who worked in a business that's, uh, that's a little bit troubled or under siege from some external forces, um, the biggest issue is how do I grow the company? How do I monetize some of these uh, uh, new revenue streams, and how do I exploit them to their, to their fullest advantage? I'm sure we do this uh, pretty similar to any, uh, uh, any person who has uh, uh, available funds and wants to make an investment. Uh, you know, we, we basically take a look at uh, whether we're buying a catalog or looking to acquire a catalog or looking to re-sign one of our major artists. We, um, we do a discounted cash flow, which is basically take a look at the future projections of what we think that artist will, uh, uh, will bear. And uh, in the publishing world, again, a little bit easier because publishing, you know, by definition has a, a reasonably consistent cash flow, uh, consistent and predictable cash flow uh, because of the, uh, uh, the varied revenue streams that are not all tied to uh, physical product. Um, so uh, we'll look at all of those. And then if it's, a, if it's a new artist, say, like, let's say we're doing an extension with somebody like a U2, We'll, say, we'll, we'll make certain assumptions as to how much product we'll get going forward, how much they'll control of the product, uh, uh, how, how that product will, will sell globally, and what additional revenue streams that'll stimulate. And we'll look at all of this and basically do a, you know, kind of a 10-year view where we look and see what our uh, incoming cash flow could be expected to be over the next 10 years. And then uh, the last step is, okay, well, what kind of investment can that bear? Can, uh, what kind of an investment can that bear still hitting, you know, the hurdle rates that are, uh, are, are, uh, are set for us as a company? Great question. Uh, first of all, let me back up and say, you know, there are really, uh, a music publisher really exploits copyrights uh, uh, and, uh, and also uh, exploits copyrights, not only copyrights we own, but copyrights we administer on behalf of others. Um, uh, the process that a publisher does is pretty similar to, a, to attempt to monetize any rights that we get, whether it's an artist rights or a pure songwriter rights. We, uh, we collect those songs, we uh, put them into our system, and we have a system basically that has automatic um, feeds, if you will, to all the major societies uh, uh, to, to, so, so that the, the copyrights are automatically registered. Uh, we use a program that's pretty, pretty common or familiar to, to most major publishers. It's called CWR, which stands for Common Works Registration. It's a standardized format that just about every society and uh, intermediary or agent around the world is trying to uh, uh, they're, they're all trying to adopt 
the same uh, uh, um, standards for accepting songs for registration. And by doing that, it makes it easier for us to do that, reduces the uh, uh, potential for problems. Uh, so uh, we, we'll enter songs into our system. They'll feed the registration programs. They'll be registered globally. So now we've done the administrative part of it, and that's perfecting your interest from a, uh, uh, from a uh, ownership perspective or from an administration perspective. So you've got the song. You've registered it. Now, now comes the difficult part, and that is if, if it's an artist, your exploitation methods are, are probably um, m more limited than they are if it's a songwriter. Uh, meaning if it's a songwriter, you're looking for every potential avenue of exploitation, getting somebody to record it, uh, uh, getting it to be used in a, in a television show, uh, getting some kind of uh, visibility for that writer. Uh, setting up, uh, uh, another way to do that is setting up uh, co-writes with, uh, with other writers or artists so that that writer can take some of his copyrighted material and actually put it on an artist that's making money or that has a, that has a, uh, um, a label deal in it and actually has product going out into the marketplace. Um, but we basically, uh, you know, to make a, a long story short, we look for all avenues of, of potential exploitation. Exploitation sounds like a, a funny word, but what you're really trying to do is take this right and monetize it. And how can you do that? And there are many avenues to do that. Film, print, uh, television, cable, video games, karaoke, anything you can do to, uh, uh, to monetize that income. And that's really the second step after um, taking care of your administrative house and making sure the songs are properly registered globally. No, I don't think so. I think it's, it's, it's very similar. Um, uh, especially if you're dealing with Anglo product, uh, I think the only limitation globally might be uh, translation, meaning does the music that you're trying to exploit uh, cross border. Um, and uh, for Anglo product, which uh, is, uh, you know, a very, very uh, a big part of the music industry, uh, it's universal. Um, so uh, I don't think there are any different methods that are used um, territory by territory for anybody. Uh, it may be for a particular market like France comes to my mind or maybe some of the territories in Southeast Asia. It, there may be limitations or it may be more difficult to use international product and some of the television stations like in France have quotas and things like that for local product. So it may, it, you know, in a very limited sense, um, curtail your ability to uh, exploit to the fullest advantage, but, uh, but, but by and large it's pretty much the same globally. You know, I think the internet is, has so many um, uh, potential applications that uh, uh, I would always say that that's a possibility. I think uh, for a songwriter here uh, to want to get, uh, you know, the easiest avenue to, to kind of exploit their, their music globally is to uh, sign with a publisher. Because a publisher like Universal, for example, we have offices in, uh, you know, greater than 40 countries worldwide. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, last year or the year before, we set up um, co-writes or we, we actually have uh, 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 we call it a confab. It's a, uh, it's a meeting of, uh, of various offices in one location where you have a songwriter from Nashville meeting with uh, a songwriter from Holland. And, uh, you know, good songwriters are good songwriters. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and almost everybody globally speaks uh, English and, uh, and, a lot na and Spanish now. So uh, we've set up a lot of these uh, uh, meeting places, if you will, to try to foster uh, cross-border collaborations with some of our writers. Uh, some of them have actually worked pretty well. We've also done Nashville, Latin America um, uh, ones where I think we've had a couple of our Nashville writers actually play songs on, uh, on uh, Spanish-speaking product. And, uh, and uh, in one instance, we had one of our writers in Miami, who is a, a writer strictly for the Latino business, uh, actually co-write a song that was uh, released in Nashville. So. Um, 
you know, those types of opportunities would probably be facilitated if you had a vehicle to do that, and that would be, a, you know, a publishing arrangement. Uh, no, we don't wait for them to come to us, although a lot of them do. I mean, you still get uh, music pitched to you uh, as a publisher the old-fashioned way. People will stop by and drop off CDs or, or they'll e email you a song. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and it's funny how it, uh, it networks its way around the office. One person listens to it, and if they like it, uh, they're, all, they're immediately uh, emailing it to uh, others in the office to get you know, a second take. It's pretty interesting because in the old days, if you had a, a cassette tape or whatever, you know, you didn't you didn't have as much uh, uh, you know possibility of that happening because somebody had to really like it to go and make another tape or make 20 tapes and hand those tapes out to the you know to all their coworkers. I think now with technology, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, exposing uh, you know just uh, you know turn in music like that to a greater audience. Is, uh, is enhanced. But we have creative staff that do everything from go to clubs at 11 o'clock at night and listen to bands that maybe they heard a buzz about, uh, to listen to some unsolicited material, uh, although I won't lie to you, uh, the, the large majority of the unsolicited material doesn't get listened to. That's just simply a volume issue. Um, so, you know, sending uh, a tape in to, uh, to anybody, a record company or a publishing company, is really the the toughest way to go. What you really have to do is, uh, you know, uh, uh, create a buzz. Uh, g you know, find a find a sponsor, if you will, and then uh, and uh, and uh, usually that's a, an easier path to exploitation. But certainly, MySpace now is uh, a place where a lot MySpace or YouTube are places where uh, our creative staff go to listen to to things that they've heard about or heard a buzz about um, musically. Yeah, well, um, for the most part, um, you know, uh, a buzz, is, you know, industry terminology is, uh, you know, record companies uh, have been using this term for a long time. A buzz just means uh, it's not a guy who came in the front door that nobody knows, who'd never heard of, never played in a club, never done a thing. You know, usually uh, a band to want to get noticed, uh, uh, the best way to do that is, um, uh, visual, uh, actually play live, play live, develop a following, a buzz, uh, or, uh, or or these days, what's happening is uh, bands are, uh, are 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 creating their own video, if you will, uploading it to YouTube, and then all they need to do is send somebody a link, and that person can link to it, and uh, you know, for three minutes of their day, you know, see it, and that can create a buzz in and of itself, just within the office. Everybody can, you know, say, wow, do you see this is amazing, and that's a buzz. I mean, a buzz is really just literally excitement uh, that you can generate, uh, other than yourself, <laughs> uh, excitement that you can generate outwardly uh, over your music and your, and your musical creations. Absolutely right. Uh, my, 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 my boys, uh, you know, I, I've told them more than one time because I'm their dad. I've said, uh, <clears throat> this is great, but it's not ready for prime time. You got to work on it. And, uh, and uh, you know, the best thing you can get at that stage of your, of your musical evolution, if you will, the best thing that you can ask for is feedback. I mean, you can't be afraid of somebody telling you it's not there yet. You know, uh, it's got possibilities, but it's not there yet. If you're afraid of hearing that, then you're in the wrong business. Because, uh, I mean, uh, you know, you can look at uh, any number of artists over the years and how many times they experienced rejection or, or negative feedback early in their career. You can't be afraid of that. So you're gonna, you have to want and embrace that feedback. And you, uh, <clears throat> if you can embrace that feedback and then, uh, and then use it and grow from it or, or learn from it, and uh, then then you're, uh, you're, you're, you'd be surprised that your output becomes uh, increasingly more uh, uh, um, palatable, commercial, if that's what you're going for. Um, so um, yes, but uh, play live. Uh, if you're in a band, get out there, uh, hone your craft, perfect 
your craft get the get tight um, uh, and uh, songwriting uh, you know work on your songwriting co continually develop it and try to get feedback and 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 grow it and and then when you're ready uh, you know that's when you uh, go out to create your buzz because when you're not ready you know you only get so many bites at the apple if somebody ha hears that you know this this guy's not good, or uh, I heard this stuff and it's not good. There's only so many times you can go down to that well. Well, um, you get a good lawyer. Uh, <laughs> if you're at the point where you're going to uh, um, uh, do a publishing deal and you really believe you, you like a publisher to... Uh, to be assisting you with global exploitation and collaborations and that sort of thing, you need to uh, make sure that you have good advice. Uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, these days, um, life of copyright deals are very rare. Um, they're increasingly rare in the music business. And, and a life of copyright deal is exactly what people are being warned about. Uh, don't give away your publishing, uh, which means that the day one you sign away your publishing and it's gone for life of copyright. That doesn't happen that much anymore. What usually will happen is uh, there's a limited term duration of your assignment of that copyright, and it's usually not the entire copyright. So if the, copyright is, if the entire copyright is 100%, what we do these days, uh, or what are more common these days, are, are called co-publishing deals, where the uh, uh, ownership of the publishing is split between the writer who retains a piece of his publishing and the publishing company who now has a piece of the publishing and therefore has a vested interest to spend all this time and effort uh, for exploitation. But even in today's uh, you know, markets, that publisher's portion, uh, the portion that's retained by the publisher is not for life of copyright. There's some period of time in the future where that reverts back to the writer. So to me, this is, uh, this is the best of both worlds. Uh, you have to uh, incentivize a publisher to do all these things. Register, exploit, plug it into the global network, use all their contacts to get film uh, collaborations, that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> but there should be, you know, in today's environment, some reasonable period of time that regardless of what happens, you can expect to own your publishing. It, yeah, if I'm, uh, uh, you know, I want to know what your contacts are. I want to know uh, how successful is your uh, film and TV uh, area, because the film and TV area or the synchronization area, as we say in publishing, they're usually the ones who are designated with uh, getting uses or obtaining uses for, the, let's, let's say, the traditional film and TV uh, avenues, which is, is very important. Uh, for starting artists. A lot of uh, uh, people, um, um, you know, will come out because they just got, you know, they got a snippet of a song in the back of Grey's Anatomy or something like that. Um, so, you know, you want to know what their, what their cr credentials are from a film and TV perspective and how plugged in they are, not only to the traditional sync areas of film and, and television, but in the non-traditional synchronization areas like video games and, uh, and the merchandising, uh, uh, which is... Uh, uh, you know, both of those are, are very, very growing revenue streams. So I want to know, you know, uh, uh, whether you can bring that to the table for me. I'll also want to make sure that my copyrights are going to be looked after globally. Uh, and that means what is your global network like? Uh, um, it may not be as big a concern if you felt like, uh, you know, you're just starting out in the USA and maybe you didn't care about, you know, the UK or Australia or some other Anglo markets, but eventually you will. So you'll want to know uh, um, what kind of global ability uh, this company has to be able to uh, uh, protect your rights and exploit them. Again, our, uh, uh, we, we call it our synchronization or our film and TV department. They uh, uh, neg are negotiating all day long with uh, 
these type of, uh, of, uh, of merchandise uh, manufacturers, if you will. Uh, and it's not just merchandise. Nowadays, you have uh, birthday cards that you open where you can actually hear a, a copyrighted work or sometimes even the original master, although that's rare, rarer. Um, <clears throat> so it's not just uh, you know, the fluffy toys or the singing fish, which most people seem to know. Uh, those are kind of uh, you know, niche businesses. Uh, you, uh, you, you basically, as I say, you need contacts and you need breadth of catalog. And what I mean by breadth of catalog is you need to be able to go to somebody and say, okay, uh, you want a song about fish. Okay, how can I, w with over a million copyrights, using Universal as an example, uh, over two million now with uh, the acquisition of BMG, how do I find out any songs that I have in my catalog that might be appropriate? for a singing fish or a shark on the wall or a big moose head or something like that. And the way to do that is uh, what, we do, what we physically do is we go through our catalog and we have people doing what we call tagging. They actually are going through the catalog and uh, categorizing all the songs by mood, genre, uh, um, you know, uh, keywords, that sort of thing. I think we've gotten up to six or 7,000 songs which are completely tagged. So if we want, the, if some merchandising company is looking for a singing fish, for example, we'll think of, you know, water, fish, swim, you know, we can do all sorts of searches on our, uh, uh, on our system uh, uh, through, through the tagged ones only. And the tagged ones are, are you know, we obviously start with the more uh, uh, recognizable uh, uh, titles and the, the ones that are currently generating the, more, the most money. Uh, because they're more recognizable, and we'll get a printout of 15 songs. And we'll send it over to them, and we'll say, here's 15, and here are the 10 that I'm, I might be able to get you, because five of them you know, may require clearance from an artist or a writer, and, uh, and we'll know which one of those are easy to clear and which ones aren't. The financial tools, we have an internally developed uh, model. Uh, it's fairly complex. Uh, we call it the IRR. Uh, it's not our terminology. It stands for Internal Rate of Return. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, you know, as I previously said, it's, um, it's a fairly uh, complex model, but uh, what it does is, is basically very simple. It, it, it uh, measures the future cash flow expected to be generated by a deal against uh, an investment to obtain the deal and then tells you what the, re the internal rate of return would be uh, given those set of assumptions. So uh, th this is a financial model that is probably um, you know, generic in a sense but has been tailored over the years uh, by me and my staff to, uh, uh, to, to more closely be aligned with uh, just music publishing. In my case, music publishing acquisitions, uh, signings of writers, um, you know, uh, extensions or renegotiations of existing deals. So uh, this model really works for any potential uh, uh, music deal we're, we're looking into. Well, interestingly, it, it hasn't changed over the last four or five years, but we always focus uh, 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 for, for music publishing on separate revenue, on, on the major music publishing rev revenue streams separately. That would be, you know, Mechanicals, Performance, Sync, and now Digital, and then Print and Other. Print and Other is usually, you know, if, if it was 3% of the total, it's, it's, um, it's a lot. So not, not as significant a, an area for most uh, catalogs. And, uh, and we do that because each one of those revenue streams has had a, a, a decidedly different path in the last few years, and uh, most analysts have uh, 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 <clears throat> projected a different uh, growth trend, or in the case of mechanicals, uh, uh, negative growth trend uh, going forward. So uh, yes, we look at each, uh, uh, each individual revenue stream and make a, a separate determination about uh, uh, the evolution of that revenue stream for that particular writer or artist.
Absolutely. Whenever we evaluate any potential property, you know, one of the things we're looking for is, um, you know, the quality of the prior earnings. Uh, and what that means is, uh, are there, uh, how good a job has been done up to this point? Uh, have they gonna, done a good job in, in the areas of registration? Or, or are the global registrations sloppy? Sometimes, for example, I think just by re-registering the catalog globally and doing it right, uh, that we can gain four or five percent income. Uh, so that's why it's good to have a good publisher globally connected. Um, <clears throat> for areas of digital, these are definitely emerging uh, areas. So you'll want to see for that particular artist, uh, all, you know, uh, Pipeline, for example. Many, uh, you know, the music publishing industry is notorious uh, for its pipeline. And what that means is it usually takes a long time between the actual event and when you collect on that event, especially in the area of uh, performance. In some territories around the world, uh, the delay can be a year. Um, so uh, you have an actual performance of a song in December 07, you're not even going to collect on it until December 08 at the first. So what we'll do when we're looking at a property is look, how have the various income streams evolved historically? Have they captured all their uh, digital upside, and we usually consider mobile as part of digital, so ringtones, ringbacks, these would all be uh, categorized as digital in, in, in our environment. So we'll, we'll look at those and say, have we, have we really reached our steady state of what our expectation is going to be for mobile or digital revenue here? And if not, we'll certainly you know, bake that into the projections going forward. It's really both, and it works chronologically, which means that we'll take a look uh, using, let's say, industry benchmarks. And let's say we believe that uh, the digital revenues for any catalog, even if there's no clear, perfect ringtone or perfect master tone, uh, 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 we'll, we'll take a look and we'll say, any catalog, you should be, you know, 7 to 10 percent of your revenue, and it depends on the catalog, but let's say 7 to 10 percent of your revenue at this point should be digital. So we'll make that determination, and then we bring in our, uh, let's call it an exploitation team, film and TV people, sync people, uh, creative people, and we say, what's your take? What do, you, what do you think can happen with this? Where can we go with this? Now, if it's an established songwriter with uh, a known, uh, you know, known product and, and, let's say, recognizable product, a little bit easier to make that determination. If, uh, if it's uh, somebody who is a little bit more in their infancy, then it's a little tougher, but it's, it's a, what we call a creative call. So it's basically, you know, okay, what do you think is the market for this person and their particular product to go? So it's really a combination of the two that we use when we're trying to evaluate, uh, you know, the types of revenue that a, a certain artist or a songwriter should, should be able to expect. Yeah, you can't uh, generalize like that because um, <clears throat> similar to any investment that you might make as an individual, uh, if you go to uh, buy a T-bill, you know you're going to get almost nothing, but there's no risk. If you go to buy junk bonds, you know they're going to promise you 20% or greater, but there's a tremendous amount of risk. So our hurdle rate uh, really varies depending on the, uh, uh, the complexity and the makeup of the, of the property involved. If there's a steady revenue stream and a predictable revenue stream and it's perceived to be a low risk, then we have a low hurdle and, uh, and we have uh, flexibility with that. If it's a brand new songwriter and there's been nothing exploited yet but it's somebody just coming in who we think has great potential, there's a higher amount of risk there. So the return that we would expect on that is greater. Uh, same thing with artists. If an artist comes in and it's a great artist but, uh, uh, and they're signed, then there's risk, but it's slightly lower. If they're not yet signed to a major label or a label, then there's greater risk. So the, the return rate or the hurdle rate really fluctuates. Uh, it's, it's perfectly correlated to risk is, is really the answer.
Uh, I'm sure you've done this, right? I don't know what your curriculum is, but uh, I don't know what your, um, you know, your, uh, what, what the chronology is of what you're going through, but I find that most people have absolutely no understanding of the total pie. So, uh, l l said simpler, uh, you know, they, they are okay to blame the music industry, which, and the music industry should, should accept its, uh, its portion of the blame. Uh, for what's happened, but they blame the music industry for an 1898 retail price. They have no idea where that comes from or who gets what. I mean, from dollar one or from penny one to 1898, how that gets cut up and why. I mean, to me, that is the most, uh, uh, the biggest revelation when I go to people and they say, oh, you know, you sh no wonder nobody buys CDs anymore. It's 1898. You know, in many instances, that is completely outside of the control of, uh, of the music companies and, uh, and, uh, and most people don't realize it, how much goes to retail, how much is actually the cost of the product, how much is paid to the publisher, what happens to that money, how much goes to unions, uh, uh, how, much, uh, you know, how much the artwork costs, everything. So literally from penny one to 1898, the buildup of, of let's say a typical CD, and even though CDs will be, you know, probably gone in 10 years, um, uh, they'll become like vinyl. Uh, there'll, there'll still be purists out there who want to collect CDs. Uh, most of them will be in our demographic, but uh, <laughs> so, so be it. But, um, uh, but uh, you know, I think people have difficulty grasping that. That's one thing. And the other thing, if I can expand on that, the other thing that uh, uh, I remember once uh, I walked up to an artist uh, at, at a Grammy party, and, uh, and uh, the artist shall remain nameless, but he, he, they were es essentially a baby band that had just hit big. And, uh, and I, I looked at the guy, he was, this is the lead singer of the band, and, and we said to him, how you doing? And he goes, oh, I'm, great. I'm having a great time. And I, just, I looked at him and I went, save your money. So <clears throat> the, the next thing that I would go to a lot of the people and the students in your class are probably all musicians or want to be musicians or have aspirations to be musicians, um, a lot of them should have some interesting war stories, let's say, about how quickly it can come and how quickly it can go. It's not like having a regular job where you make $40,000 a year and every year you can, every day you can expect on that, there, uh, that, that type of uh, uh, revenue stream. The peaks and valleys are enormous and many people, uh, many, there are many famous cases of people who uh, did not manage their money well, did not look after their own personal finances, and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and maybe, uh, maybe some war stories would be good to tell people how to, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, how the ebbs and flows of the music industry work and how that will definitely affect lifestyle. I have, uh, uh, you know, I don't know the exact number. I would say uh, direct reports to me are in the neighborhood of 20, and that's globally, uh, because uh, I'm the CFO of the company, so I have the, the, the finance person in every major territory around the world has a reporting obligation to me. And in addition, in Los Angeles, which is our worldwide headquarters, uh, there are three direct reports I have who work in global finance, and then there are, uh, uh, various other departments, uh, royalties, copyright, income tracking, uh, IT, office management, uh, U.S. finance, all these department heads report to me as well in the context of my uh, uh, executive vice president of operations uh, title. So I have about 20 people that report directly to me globally. Yes, most of the internships, though, uh, uh, ironically, uh, have not been in, the, let's say, areas of uh, operations and finance. Um, most of the internships that we do have more been in film and TV or creative because many of the uh, students that come in uh, seem to be, at least initially, more interested in going in that direction with their, uh, uh, with their potential career. Uh, so. Uh, it seems like literally year round we have uh, in the Los Angeles office, uh, we have internships uh, working for A&R, which uh, 
A and R and creative is 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 the same, and we have internships in the film and TV TV area. Historically, we haven't done internships in areas like finance and operations because those are a little more skill set oriented, whereas interns generally may have a specific idea of where they want to go. Um, um, not to say we're not open to it, but it just hasn't been something we've done yet. One of the uh, interesting things about our business is that uh, uh, <clears throat> there's no shortage of work to do. Uh, you know, it's not like we're all sitting back in our chair thinking. You know, we're, we all roll up our sleeves. There's a lot to do, and there, and there are actually some great opportunities for internships, so I'd be totally open to it. So uh, I guess the, there's good news and bad news with that answer. Um, I work, you know, predominantly in finance, and uh, and uh, it's a labor-intensive part of the business. Uh, it's very deadline-driven uh, finance, and uh, I, you know, I love it. I, I I've never wanted to do anything else, and I never wanted to do it anywhere else but the music industry. But it is very deadline-driven and uh, and very uh, um, intense at times. So uh, funny you should say, uh, are there positions in my uh, department? Literally, we've, we, there, there's, there, there's been a fair amount of turnover um, in the last two years because we've been very acquisition uh, uh, driven as a company. We just, uh, as I said, we bought uh, BMG Music, which was, uh, we were number three and they were number four. We've combined to uh, create the largest publisher in the world. So um, we've gone through about 18 months of, of very intense work, let's say. And uh, it's not for everybody. So my, my finance department in Los Angeles uh, literally, I think, was eight people. And uh, about uh, three months ago, uh, six of them were temps. Uh, wow. Because we had one or two people leave because they wanted to go back to school. Uh, one person left just because uh, they they wanted to move into a different area. There's a there's so there's there's a normal amount of turnover. But recently, with the amount of M and A activity we've had, it's a very demanding job. And to be perfectly frank, it's not for everybody. So it's uh, you know I think there there's always openings and there's always openings for good people. And anybody who's good is always interested in upward mobility. So we're we're always looking for that. Can I ask you what you would expect? Hmm. Uh, as I, I used to go to my son's high school and talk to uh, kids who were thinking about whether they should go to college at all. And I told him the most important thing that you have to you know, uh, know, uh, the most important thing you have to do is get a degree. Uh, okay, you get a degree. And then when you come into a job, most of what you need to know, you'll be taught. Okay, so what you have to have is you have to have the degree. You have to have the basics that any kind of an undergraduate degree, and certainly in a, in a, in a, in a music uh, uh, curriculum like yours, uh, would give. That would give you the, the foundation that anybody would need. Nobody is going to, nobody sticks anybody in a chair and goes, okay, this is your job now. Let me know if you have any questions. That's not the way it works. You know, so you're looking for smart people who have the foundation. And the degree often provides that, it, and that is a, a general, basic, well-rounded understanding of the industry you're in, and that's it. What you're specifically going to be doing, nobody expects you to know that when you come in. You'll be taught that. And uh, you know, if somebody says to you, oh, well, this is publishing and that's recorded music, they'd expect you to know that. You know, it's just a basic differential. So as long as you have the foundation, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, then you're then you're prepared to go. Yeah, well, you know, Universal has a website uh, where they list all open positions. It's it's uh, I don't know it off the top of my head. I can give it to you, but it's uh, it lists all open positions, and I get emails from people all the time. Uh, I actually went to um, you know I I graduated from UCLA with my MBA, and I get uh, a lot of MBA students sending me emails, people I don't know, just because I'm in the alumni association. And uh, I get emails from them saying, um, I'm a UCLA MBA grad, and uh, 
uh, I see there's this open position, anything you can do to help. And uh, what I'll usually do is uh, take a look at the uh, resume, send it to HR with uh, my recommendation and say, tell them, you know, listen, we should at least get this person in for an interview. So uh, uh, what they would do is probably keep an eye out for open positions because they're all posted and, uh, and or, uh, you know, um, anyone you know, uh, get them a resume and ask them to forward it to HR. And that would include me. I do that all the time. I, I view uh, talent finding uh, as something that's part of, part of my job as well. You like to see that people have worked. <laughs> this is something that I tell my son all the time. I go, you know, uh, you can take the best student in the world, but if they haven't had a job, and, and I mean any job, any job, because you hold a job and you have a job, it shows responsibility, it's real world, it's street credibility, it's all those things. You need to have a job. You need to get a job and show that you've been in the workforce. And that, you know, if not, people look at you and go, well, this person's never done anything other than go to school. And that's important, but having a, having a real background from, a, a, from a, a work perspective and having something that you can put on your resume and say, well, here's, here's what I've done, I think that's, that's very key. You know, focus on, uh, you know, and also, uh, uh, you know, creating, that would be, I say, first and foremost. And the second is creating the link between what you've done in school and what you want to do. So, you know, uh, and by that link, I'd say, how does what you've taken in school qualify you for this role? Or how does it, and what, what makes you feel that you're uniquely qualified for this? Um, so those are the two things I look for. And, uh, um, and, uh, and, and the most important thing that I'm interested in is communication skills. People who can uh, uh, hold themselves well, speak well, and write well, get far in anything they do. You have to be able to articulate uh, to your boss that you know what it is you're being asked to do. And, and a lot of times you'll get the smartest people in the world come out of school, but uh, the communication skills are not where they need to be. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, you know, everybody, you, as an interviewee, you need to know that uh, the most important trait that you have is flexibility. Uh, <clears throat> it, you have to flex your communication style to the individual who's interviewing you. If you have somebody who's very um, serious, formal, then you need to be, you need to react in an appropriate way to that. If you have somebody who is uh, um, a little, uh, uh, more, uh, let's say, outgoing or informal, then you can relax or flex your communication style accordingly. Um, what I look for more, uh, I, I, uh, if I may pat myself on the back, my, my strongest trait, I believe, is in finding good people. Um, I've, uh, I've had a very, I've been very lucky in my life, in my, in my entire career. I think I've, I've hired uh, some of the best people in the world, and they, they all still work for me. Uh, <clears throat> my main thing is I hire people that I like to work with. Uh, that's what I hire. I hire somebody where I look at them and I go, I could work with this person. You know, and uh, because, you know, meaning no disrespect to any other traits, um, there's a lot of people who have good grades. You know, and there's a lot of people who, you know, interview well, but can I work with this person? Is this somebody I could see coming in and working with day to day? And if they are, then I'll teach them whatever I know, and I'll, I'll give them whatever I have to offer and, and help them grow as an individual. But if I see or feel that it's not a fit from a personality perspective, then uh, I'd be probably less inclined to go forward. I am, uh, <clears throat> when it's my name on it, I'm incredibly hands-on, but that being said, I'm mostly a hands-off guy. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm very proud of my, uh, my history of being able to hire and, uh, and, uh, and employ and keep and retain good people because uh, I don't want to have to tell them what to do. Uh, I expect them to know what to do. I don't want to tell them they have to come in on the weekend. If they do, I want them to know they have to come in on the weekend. Uh, the best employee is one that you don't need to tell 
uh, and this is my opinion and p people will differ in this, you don't need to tell them what to do or how hard to work or when to work. You either have it or you don't. You know, and if you have that skill set and you say, I have to finish this by Monday, I'm going to come in on Saturday and do it. When they tell me that, I say, you do what you got to do. You, you know, it's your call. I don't tell anybody when to take vacations. I've never told anybody not to take a vacation. I've never gotten involved in that at all. I, uh, I, I sign the form and then I say, hey, on Friday, give me this. And they go, I'm not going to be here Friday. You signed the form. And I went, all right, well, then Monday or Thursday, if you can do it, you know, whatever. So I don't even pay attention to it. You tell me when you can be here and you tell me when your workload is such that you can take vacation. You know, so I don't, I'm, I'm pretty hands off as that goes. But if my name goes on it, then I, I get very involved. Um, yeah, uh, there are many different types of careers in the music industry. So uh, further to my comment earlier where I said a lot of people come in and they have kind of like a notion of what the music industry is about. My advice would be to be open-minded. I mean, it's a business, you know, and as a business, you know, there are many aspects of it that are similar to any other business. You have a, you know, you have a legal department and a business affairs department, so the music industry needs lawyers. You have a finance department, so the music industry needs accountants. You know, you have, uh, 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 you know, you have income tracking and operations. The backgrounds of those people are, are broad and diversified. There's no one way that you need to go or be if you want to be in the music industry. You have to be, um, you have to have a good breadth of knowledge and be open-minded. And that's the only advice that I could give because a lot of people look at it you know, because they're, uh, you know, they're, um, I want to say they're, con they're, they're swayed by the music industry. They think it's sexy, it's, it's you know, it's entertainment and, uh, and that's that. But, but you really have to realize it's, it is, but it's also a business. And it's run like a business and you have all the departments of any other business. And I'm sure B IBM has many of the same businesses. Uh, but uh, so you have to go into it realizing it's a business. It's, uh, you know, the only difference is probably the clothes you wear. <laughs>